Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value. That's a value investing service published by Stansberry Research. We have a really cool show, an awesome guest today. Let's get to it all right now. Okay, this rant is going to be short. Uh, now, you remember last week I talked about training and, and what it means to be a trained investor versus being like a trained musician or a trained uh, doctor. And we talked about, for example, you might remember, I talked about Ben Graham, right? The father of value investing. He wrote a mammoth book called Security Analysis and another book called The Intelligent Investor that you really ought to read. And, you know, he was Warren Buffett's mentor, et cetera, et cetera. You know Ben Graham, right? And we said he had different advice for the trained securities analyst versus the untrained security buyer. And it's funny that he distinguishes the trained guy as the analyst and the untrained guy as the buyer because, because I know people, you know, they hear things at cocktail parties and they just hit buy on their computer rather than really analyzing. But so the trained analyst, uh, anything could conceivably be cheap enough for, for the trained analyst to buy or expensive and ugly enough for the trained analyst to short. But Graham said the untrained security buyer should just never put money into a low-grade enterprise on any terms. In other words, stay away from bad businesses and bad securities. Uh, you know, risky ones, right? Stay with the high-quality stuff, which is good advice. But this week, I was thinking you might have left last week's rant thinking, okay, training what are you talking about? I have a job and a spouse and kids and a life and a house and stuff. I don't have time for training. You know, I can't take off four years and go to school to be a trained security analyst. And yet, you got to train your brain to do this. There's discipline. It really is like playing an instrument to be an investor. You got to do it every day. Some, there's got to be some discipline that you practice every day. And I'm afraid the natural discipline we practice is no discipline at all, which is like watching the news and getting scared every 10 minutes because of the president's tweeting or some, you know, other thing happening in the world. And we just tend to be a little reactionary and there's no discipline. So what I'm going to do today is something I never do. I always give suggestions, things you ought to do, or just tell you what I think. This is what I do. This is what I think. Today, I'm going to tell you what to do. I am not, this is, this is, absolutely what to do. And I'm not even going to explain it much. I'm just going to tell you to do this. That's why the rant's going to be a little shorter. Okay. There's six things that I want to tell you what to do to help you practice a better daily discipline as an investor and just practice more discipline in general, not even, just, not even daily. The first thing I want you to do is read a piece that's free of charge on the internet called Avoid News by a guy named Rolf Dobelli. Uh, he has a couple of good books out too, but, but you don't need those. You need the piece called Avoid News. Read it. Read it slowly and carefully. Think about it. Practice. Try to practice it as much as possible. In our interview with um, our guest Tim Price recently, in the last couple episodes, and he, talk, he mentioned specifically the piece Avoid News, and we talked about the prospect of how much news you might be able to avoid. And I think it's quite a bit. I think you can be a lot more selective about what you take in from the Wall Street Journal and, you know, TV news, um, you know, Fox Business or Bloomberg News or whatever kind of financial thing you watch on TV. That's the first thing to do. Avoid news. Second, we've talked about before, which is you must master the skill of saving money. We have a, um, we did a rant on that a while back, and I just, you know, I, I there's no way to replace this skill with anything else. If you don't have the skill of regularly saving money, you're you're going it's going to be a challenge for you to have any kind of discipline as an investor. The third thing I want you to do 
I've said this a bunch of times, but I feel like I still haven't made the point enough. You must, must, must read The Most Important Thing by Howard Marks. If you want to know what training is, this training that I keep talking about from last week and this week, it's all the stuff in that book. And remember I said there's 18 most important things, right? Last week we talked about um, the, the younger, they're trained, but they're younger resident physicians at the local hospital versus the chief resident who I spoke to. And the younger physicians are obsessed with the tourniquet time, the amount of time it takes to do a procedure in, the, in surgery, uh, almost to the exclusion of other things, you know, which doesn't make me feel very good as a potential patient. But, but the chief resident was like, you know, certainly you don't want to keep the patient under any longer than is absolutely necessary, but you don't want to rush through it. You want a good outcome for the patient. And that should drive all your decision making, not beating your friend you know, 10 seconds on tourniquet times, right? So the, so experience plus training, you know, really, really means something. Um, and it's more subtle. That chief residence view is a more subtle, nuanced, complex view. There's more to it than one variable. And that is what you learn by reading the most important thing by Howard Marks. I'm not kidding. Keep that book at arm's length. Read it regularly. Also read chapter 20 of the Intelligent Investor regularly. I have, a, I have an alert on my phone every month, read chapter 20. Because I'll tell you something, these things are like jumping out of an airplane. Parachute or not, it's an unnatural act, okay? So doing these things, recognizing risk, controlling risk, uh, investing with a margin of safety, which is chapter 20 of the Intelligent Investor, it, they're unnatural acts, being a good investor, you know, how, how normal does Warren Buffett seem to you? How normal do, do any of these people seem to you? Well, they're not. These are unnatural acts that they're engaged in. And you must train your mind to do them. You're not going to come out of the womb naturally just having good investment discipline. And I'm telling you, do this stuff and it will go a long way to helping you get it. Number four. Our guest today is an awesome guy. Part of the reason I'm doing a shorter rant is because we wanted to spend plenty of time with him. Um, and he recommended to me that we should keep a decision journal. And you know something? As soon as he told me that, I started doing it right away. And I've been doing it for a couple of weeks, and we'll talk to him about it a little bit today. Um, keep a decision journal. All your decisions as an investor. I just go into it daily. I open up daily and, you know, put... I just have a Microsoft Word file, and, and I just put the date on there and, re, and write down all the decisions and stuff related to investing decisions for the day. Most days, there's no decision. It's just, you know, a lot of times I, I write what I'm not going to do, what I'm not going to react to. Decision journal. Very good. It, you can record your actual state of mind instead of fantasizing about it later on. Okay. That's number four. The fifth thing, the last thing, look, I know that 99% of the people in the sound of my voice are not professional investors with lots of investment discipline. So, you know, if you, if you buy a stock and, and because you read something by me or somebody else and we have a lot of conviction about it and I, you know, I say, well, I don't care if the thing falls 50%, I'm not going to recommend selling it, you know, because I have a high conviction. Maybe that doesn't fit your personality. And I think it doesn't fit a lot of people's personalities. Because most people, what will happen is they'll say, yeah, I'll hold through a 60% drawdown. You know, I'll hold through a 60% bear market in the S&P 500. I got what it takes. Yeah, and then the day comes when that thing is down 60% and you sell out in a panic and take a catastrophic loss. It's horrible. So... Well, as a Stansberry editor, you know, Stansberry's done a great job of using trailing stops to help people avoid these catastrophic losses. To me, that's the main value of it. The main value is that, yes, sure, it will take you out of positions sometimes that are going to go up after you stop out. But a lot of times it'll take you out before the thing, you know, if your trailing stop is 25%, you'll take a 25% loss and the thing will go down 40, 50, 60, whatever, and you won't take any of that extra loss. So over time, I think 
it is a form of discipline. And if you ever don't need it, you'll be the one who will make that decision. You'll know one day when you don't need to do that, if you ever don't need to do it. And some people, you know, they don't use it on 100% of their portfolio. Thing number five that I'm telling you to do here is actually go to tradestops.com. Because look, TradeStops, we have a lot of different products at Stansberry, but TradeStops is the only one that I can say is probably going to be right for like 99% of our readers, at least, maybe even 100%. Because professionals, <laughs> you know, we've learned that from the statistics that professionals aren't any better than the rest of us. They can't beat the market most of the time either. So they should probably be using trailing stop discipline. And that will keep you out of a lot of the trouble that people who don't have good discipline get themselves into. So five things. Read Avoid News by Rolf DeBelli so you can train yourself not to just take in everything the news media throws at you. You can select what you want to go into your brain. Learn the discipline of saving money. That's number two. Number three is for God's sake, read Howard Marks. It's so easy. Just buy the darn book, keep it at arm's length, and read it. And read chapter 20 of The Intelligent Investor. Just do this, for God's sake. Decision journal. Keep a decision journal. Yes, sit down at your computer and type out what you did. Exactly. Record your state of mind and the decision you made. How many shares you bought, what it was, why you bought it. And your state of mind, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this or I'm leery about this. I don't know if this is going to work or not, whatever. Why did you put, you know, X amount of dollars into it? Why not more? Why not less? Record every aspect of the decision. And later on, when you're questioning it, go back and look and see what, you know, why you did what you did <laughs> so that you don't lie to yourself about it because people do that. We're, just, we're only human. This stuff we have to do this stuff because human beings are like this. And the fifth thing is, for God's sakes, go to tradestops.com. Okay? Use trade stops. You know, it'll save you from having to actually have discipline. It'll impose discipline on you. Right? It'll be your mom and your dad. And it'll say, it'll give you an alert that you can set up and go, oh, you're stopped out. You need to sell. It won't sell for you. They can't get in that deeply into your account. But you get the message. Okay? Just do this stuff for God's sake. All right? Okay. Enough said. Moving on. All right, let's talk about what's new in the world. And the first thing that caught my eye this morning is that Microsoft is investing a billion dollars in an artificial intelligence project um, with OpenAI, which is the company co-founded by Elon Musk, Elon Musk and three other guys. And I don't know the extent of Musk's involvement in OpenAI, um, but I would imagine he's assembled a team of really smart people because he tends to be able to do that. So the deal is that Microsoft and, and Musk's company, OpenAI, they announced this partnership to build what they're calling AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. Uh, software, I assume, um, to tackle more complex tasks than what traditional AI. <laughs> We're already talking about such a thing as traditional AI. That's weird. Um, so Microsoft is going to invest a billion dollars in OpenAI as part of this project. And OpenAI is going to use Microsoft as its uh, you know exclusive cloud provider. Okay. So Microsoft gets the cloud business from OpenAI. They put a billion into OpenAI. And first of all, they said they're going to solve more complex problems, but they only named like all the stuff I read. They, they said uh, OpenAI, Microsoft's vision for artificial general intelligence to work with people to help solve currently intractable multidisciplinary problems, including global challenges such as climate change, more personalized health care, and education, which I, I know that health care and education are kind of uh, pet concerns of Bill Gates. I know he's put money, uh, his philanthropic organization put money into the, the Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think it's called, 
uh, has put money into education and uh, he's been very frank about, you know, mistakes that he's made, things that work, things that don't work. More personalized health care, climate change, you know. I, I don't know. Maybe I've lived on the left coast too long. I just I hear climate change. I'm like, oh, boy, you know, because it's such a heavily, heavily politicized subject. And you hear about somebody putting a billion dollars to work. It's like, oh, geez, what are they going to do? Uh, but overall, look, um, Microsoft's an incredible company. Um, you know, it's been a multi, multi bagger. I sold it way too soon in extreme value. It gushes free cash flow. A billion dollars is not a lot of money. You know, they pay off all their debts, all of their debts, which are like 73 billion, I think. Uh, and they still have close to 60 billion in cash left over. Okay, so a billion is not a lot of money. Plus, like just last quarter, they generated 11 billion in free cash flow. So billions and billions come out of this thing every year. And a billion dollar investment at this point in their history is not a huge thing. However, isn't it cool though that in that business, a billion dollar you know, you, a billion dollar investment can become tens of billions worth of business value at some point. It's really cool. It's it's optionality. It buys some optionality. And so if you know, you could get you could wind up with a really great outcome from a relatively small investment. And it's the press release isn't telling us much. So so who knows? Who knows how this is going to turn out? But if you're a Microsoft shareholder, you like investing, <laughs> I don't even believe I'm saying this, a billion dollars, a relatively small investment compared to the overall value of the, and cash generation ability of the business in order to potentially create a huge, huge outcome. So that's great. So, you know, speaking of of Elon Musk um, involved in this open AI thing with Microsoft. I want you to, I was telling you what to do when I started the program today. I want to tell you what else to do. Here's another thing I want to tell you to do. Um, I want you to follow, if you're interested in Tesla at all, okay? If you're interested in Tesla at all, I want you to follow Whitney Tilson's Tesla emails. He really covers this thing very well. Now he's short, but Whitney's a really good guy and he'll publish uh, people's bullish viewpoints in his emails. And they're very detailed. Whitney just works and works and works. He puts out so much material. He's like a machine. Um, so I highly recommend you follow him. And to do that, you have to send a blank email to tsla-subscribe at mailer.casecapital.com. And I'll put this link on the page for this episode on investorhour.com. But I'll, let me just spell it out for you. T-S-L-A-S-U-B-S-C-R-I-B-E at M-A-I-L-E-R dot K-A-S-E-C-A-P-I-T-A-L dot com. Okay? Tesla dash subscribe at mailer dot case capital dot com. And that'll get you Whitney Tilson's Tesla emails. So if you're interested in the company at all, maybe you're short, maybe you're long, maybe you don't care and you just find it very entertaining, um, I would encourage you to follow them. And also, Whitney's a really good thinker and investor, and it pays to, to just see how his mind is working on this problem of, of you know, what, what's the outcome going to be for Tesla. Okay, do that. Next thing that caught my eye today, uh, before we move on to our interview here, is that Alibaba says, Alibaba, the Chinese e-commerce giant, they want to be like the go-to online marketplace for U.S.-based businesses to do business with each other, like B2B. Um, and they said, you know, they're launching, they have big plans for the U.S. market. They're launching new capabilities for U.S. businesses on Alibaba.com. And they're kicking off in Brooklyn, New York with a national tour. Um, and they're going to recruit U.S. small business to sell on their platform. Okay. And th the reason this caught my eye is like um, capitalism works, right? But people think it's broken when companies like Amazon and Facebook and Google just come in and dominate their market and wipe out all competition. I mean, Amazon is a brutal competitor. 
you know, they're not wor- they're not like all concerned about making a profit. <laughs> and when you can afford that luxury, uh, you know, you really you have a big advantage over your competitors who have to answer to investors. So, you know, I think things are maturing in the online space. And, you know, there are people who aren't going away. Walmart's not going away. Um, you know, other, other people aren't, aren't going away. Now, they're, they make a small percentage of online sales. Amazon is still the dominator, you know. Uh, and I don't, I don't shop at Walmart online. You know, I shop at Amazon online just like everybody else. Uh, but I like seeing competition. And I hope Alibaba is capable of competing with Amazon. And then I hope sometime after that, someone else is capable of competing with Amazon and Alibaba because all of that will be good for you and me. All of that will be good for for customers. And believe me, Amazon has been great for customers. They suck all the margin out and, you know, they shop around for the best price. You know, it's part of what they do. Um, I always get these updates in my cart. I have a giant, I have about 230 books uh, in my save for later in my cart. And so I get a list every day of, you know, prices that were adjusted. Some are adjusted upward, but, so, you know, a lot of them are adjusted downward because they look around the web for uh, the best price. So they've, they've done us some good, and that's why we're all using it. It's super convenient. We can't resist. And I think, you know, Alibaba is like a Chinese version of that, and we'll see if they can kind of make a dent in Amazon. I hope they can. That'll be good for us. All right. That's that's the news for today. We have a wonderful interview today, but first, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Ten years ago, we created the Atlas 400 to surround ourselves with the best and smartest people in the world and to experience all the best things life has to offer. The purpose of the Atlas 400 is simple. Extraordinary people in extraordinary places doing extraordinary things. How do we achieve this? Eight to 10 times a year, we host amazing adventures around the world. These trips get people out of their daily routines, out of their comfort zones, and place them in a faraway land with a group of like-minded people. That's the way to build friendships, to make lasting relationships. It's easy to open up when you've spent the day in a race car with someone or ziplined across Patagonia with them. It's different from your typical business conference interaction. Imagine yourself in the company of over 100 of the world's most accomplished people, traveling the world, enjoying new friendships, having new adventures, discovering enormous new opportunities, perhaps seeing your life and yourself in a whole new way. We believe business first is the wrong way to go about life. Focus on your relationships, and opportunities will inevitably spring from those relationships. I hope you take advantage of this opportunity to change your life. If you're interested in learning more about membership in the Atlas 400, go to www.theatlas400.com forward slash sign up. That's www.theatlas400.com forward slash sign up. Partner code Stansberry. Okay, everybody, it's time for our interview. I'm really excited about this one. Today, our guest is Michael Mobison. He's one of my favorite people in the whole financial world. Michael J. Mobison is Director of Research at Blue Mountain Capital Management. Prior to joining Blue Mountain, he was Head of Global Financial Strategies at Credit Suisse and Chief Investment Strategist at Leg Mason Capital Management. He is also the author of three books, including More Than You Know, Finding Financial Wisdom in Unconventional Places, named in the 100 Best Business Books of All Time by 800 CEO Reed. Michael has been an adjunct professor of finance at Columbia Business School since 1993 and received the Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence in 2009 and 2016. He is also chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Santa Fe Institute, a leading center for multidisciplinary research in complex systems theory. Michael Mobison, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you, Dan, and that was a very gracious introduction. I appreciate it. Well, we, we, we specialize in very long, gracious introductions around here. So I usually start by asking folks in your line of work when they first got interested in finance. 
But you kind of did the world a service by telling us about when you got hired at Drexel Burnham Lambert in your book about um, success, uh, the success equation. So I guess what I want to know is, what was there something in your youth that presaged your career in any way that, you know, sort of foreshadowed what, what you've become today? Uh, I would say uh, most definitely not. <laughs> so I actually had no idea really what I wanted to do when I got out of school. Um, as I as I may have mentioned in that book, I was a, a government major, you know, basically a liberal arts guy. I had studied economics as a minor, but wasn't really I didn't really study any business um, formally. Um, growing up, I was mostly into into sports and athletics, and and probably devoted too much of my time to playing sports versus uh, hitting the books. Um, and and then, and you can see throughout all my work that I I still am a big um, sports fan. But um, I do think that uh, having a liberal arts background, for me at least, um, set me up in a certain way that was useful, which was when I came onto Wall Street, it was, and I think it still is to some degree, but it was sort of replete with, you know, old wives' tales and rules of thumb, and this is how we do things. And I did have an inclination to try to understand things from first principles, so even pretty early on, I, I spent some time trying to understand why people came up with these rules of thumbs, you know, where where those things uh, stood out, uh, stood up, and where that they they stood out and didn't make any sense. So um, and that's the first thing. And the second thing I'll say is that I have always been just sort of a, even as a kid, pretty pretty comfortable with numbers. Um, even though I did study uh, government in college, my High school guidance counselor really wanted me to uh, apply to, and I actually did a bunch of engineering schools. He really thought I should be an engineer. So I've always been comfortable with numbers, and I think that's also very complimentary when you go into into finance in particular, and I end up being an analyst. Uh, some comfort and numeracy, I think, is a huge asset. It's interesting to me that you have wound up in finance because as I have, I have your, your books kind of piled on my desk here, and as I look through them, Certainly, there's lots of stuff about finance. I mean, it's very clear um, what this person does for a living. But it seems to me that you're evolving into someone who started out thinking about making good decisions in finance, and now it's just about helping anybody make a better decision. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it is. And I and I and I would just go back and say, I mean, you mentioned in the introduction, I started teaching at Columbia Business School in 1993, and I think part of that was the evolution of that, which was. Um, when you say, well, you know, you teach, I teach security analysis, which is basically how to analyze a company or analyze a stock. And, you know, there are certain techniques that we, you know, we teach about how to do valuation exercises, how to do a competitive strategy analysis and so forth. But as I got into that, so, so I'll make two comments. First is, you know, when I was in, uh, approached about teaching that course, my first reaction was this should be pretty easy, right? Because all I have to do is sort of, and I was an analyst, right? So all I have to do is sort of watch myself and make a bunch of, make a bunch of slides and present on it. Um, but the first thing it does is forces introspection. So, um, you know, if you have to communicate what you do all day to someone else effectively and clearly and compellingly, I think it really prompts you to think about what you're doing and whether you're doing things the right way. The second thing that came up pretty quickly was, in my mind, as I studied investors, and especially great investors, it became, I think, quite clear that what distinguished um, the very best from the average was not their analytical skills. It's just say that the analytical skills um, or, or you know, understanding accounting and those kinds of things, those become anti for the game. But really what distinguished them, distinguished them was their decision making. And in particular, decision making in, in very stressful situations, right? When, when markets zoom to extremes, it's very difficult to not be carried uh, to those extremes emotionally as well. And so that got me very interested in this under, just understanding how we think about decision making. Now, it's interesting when I went to college in the mid 1980s, there was not a lot. I mean, there were psychology courses, obviously, but there was not a lot on decision making. And, you know, obviously, Kahneman and Tversky did a lot of their wonderful work in the 1970s and early 80s, but it really hadn't permeated a lot of mainstream academia and certainly hadn't made it its way into uh, like the business curriculum or finance curriculum. So I think that I was also, you know, so that, that, that whole area has been a burgeoning area for probably a quarter century now. And so I was able to sort of latch on to some of that stuff in the earlier days. So it's a, I think it's a combination of those things. And, and then you, once you start to build this toolkit of thinking about the world 
in terms of probability, thinking about the role of luck and outcomes, whether, again, it's your you know, favorite baseball team or your career or something else, um, it starts to open up um, the opportunity to think about or introduce a lot of really valuable mental models that expand way beyond your day job into every aspect of, of your life. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of what we do is um, the quality of our decisions plus um, plus or minus the role of luck. And so the only thing you can really control is your decision making. So it, it, I think it benefits all of us to start to get uh, as good as we can at doing it. Yeah. And in that vein, I want I hope you won't mind. I just want to read a little bit from the success equation. And it's at the end of um, the introduction right before chapter one. And you're quoting a fellow named Richard Epstein. Uh, who is a physicist trained or a game theorist trained in physics. And he notes that there is no way to assure that you'll succeed if you participate in an activity that combines skill and luck. But he does say it is gratifying to rationalize that we would rather lose intelligently than win ignorantly. And Michael, as soon as I read that, I thought of these people who say, I'd rather be lucky than smart, but I'll never say that again. Once I heard this, God, that's because good. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a lack of isn't is when you say I'd rather be lucky than smart, isn't it a lack of appreciation for process versus outcome, which is a major theme of your work? Don't you think? For sure, and I and I think that um, it's it's interesting that that aphorism. There are a lot of aphorisms around luck, and uh, that's just one of them. I I that one's always that one that one candidly has always baffled me. I've never really understood it, and I think it's probably not a good way to go through life, right? Obviously, and you know one of the ways to think about uh, process or skill and luck is to think a lot about what's in your control and what's not in your control. And to do all that you can to um, improve your likelihood of, of favorite outcomes based on what's in your control. And a lot of that is skill and that's effort. And, um, and then become, you know, almost philosophical about the, the luck component. So this idea that I'd rather be lucky than smart, I don't, I've never understood why anybody would ever adhere to that, <laughs> that adhere to that point of view. Now, when you're lucky and we all get lucky from time to time, something good happens you know, you should be grateful for it, but recognize that it was not, it had nothing to do with you and uh, that next time around, you shouldn't expect it again. But I have to tell you that idea of we would le- rather lose intelligently than win ignorantly. Um, you know, it, it's not exactly like um, a, a big encouragement. It's not exactly like, let's go and do these activities where luck is involved. I don't get a great feeling that I really want to want to have luck being a big factor in my life once I read that. Uh, and yet, right. here we are in finance, right? I mean, and luck is involved. Right. I will say, though, it's interesting that, you know, like uh, my friend Annie Duke, who wrote a great book called Thinking in Bets, and, and, you know, someone who was trained as a cognitive psychologist and understands a lot of these topics, you know, but poker players, they you know, you can't be an elite poker player without understanding that intimately, right? And and they have to deal with it intimately. Now, the way they offset that is they increase the sample size. So they just play a lot of games, spend a lot of time at the table, and they they have they can have some um, confidence that their skill will shine through at the end of the day. But in any short stretch, obviously, you know, it, it can be luck that dominates what's going on. And, you know, the world of finance is also tricky because I think that, um, you know, it's this concept we call the paradox of skill, which is the reason the market feels like luck is so important is not because the participants in markets are not smart or dedicated or, and we'd say, skillful. It's because there's a mechanism here called prices or asset prices. And the fact that everybody's so hardworking and skillful and thoughtful means that most of the information, most of the time, gets reflected in prices. So price, prices tend to be a fairly reasonable estimate of value. And as a consequence, it appears like things are close to random or you know, luck plays a bigger role. So it's the paradox of skill says when activities where both skill and luck contribute to outcomes, it can be the case that as skill increases, luck becomes more important. And the key distinction there is between um, – you know, just absolute level of skill, which has clearly been every domain you could look at has been rising 
and relative skills. So I think the key insight is that investing, the relative skills gone down because pricing has become by and large more efficient. Now there's a continuum of efficiency in different asset prices and so forth, but that's the basic principle. So investing feels much more random um, even though skill is much higher than it's ever been. So that's a hard thing for people to sort of get their heads wrapped around. Right. I read an abstract of a paper recently that pointed out that, you know, the more skillful investment managers become, the more incentive investors have to buy index funds because there's, right, the prices are pushed up and arbitraged out. And I have to tell you, Michael, I, I owe you kind of a debt of gratitude because um, I know we said you wrote three books in the introduction, but there was another book called Expectations Investing that was you and a fellow named Alfred Rappaport, um, which really helped me and changed. It, it gave me exactly what I was looking for because I was struggling as a value investor trying to use discounted cash flow in a smart way, but it's all based on prediction, Right, I have to predict the cash flows in the future, the predict the revenues and predict the margins and the taxes and all the rest of it. And I thought, well, I don't know the future. And then you came along with this book and flipped that on its head. And, and we do that now. We do price implied expectations analysis in the, the newsletter I write called Extreme Value. So thank you, Michael Mobison. Uh, and, and that's a great way to think about asset prices, I think. And, I, and I'll say, I mean, that goes back to, you mentioned sort of the path into finance. And I mentioned this, you know, walking into Wall Street and, and feeling like a big cacophonous, um, you know, symphony. And, you know, the, the story is that one of my <clears throat> training program mates gave me a copy of Rappaport's 1986 book called Creating Shareholder Value. And he gave it to me for a very different, there was actually a chapter toward the back of the book. So he gave it, so his motivation to give it to me had some nothing to do really with the core of the concepts. But I read that book and it was like really a light bulb going off for me. And it was a, clearly a professional epiphany. And chapter seven of that original book was called Stock Market Signals to Managers. The audience was corporate executives. And the argument was, hey, corporate executive, your stock's at you know, $50 a share. If you make investments that earn above the cost of capital, that may be insufficient for your stock to do well. You have to do better than what the market thinks. So as a consequence, you have to understand what the market thinks. And so I was like, you know, that was a, an amazing point for me to say like, oh, we can reverse engineer what's priced in and understand where that bar is set. And then think about whether the company is likely to achieve or not achieve that, that set of expectations. So to me, that was immediately, you know, I went right into my analytical tool bag and you know, I got to meet Rappaport for the first time in the, you know, the early 1990s. Uh, it was a thrill for me to meet him. And by the way, we still work uh, closely together on projects. He's now 87 and doing great. Um, and then in the late 1990s, he said, you know, we should probably try to take these ideas that we've been um, volleying back and forth and really apply them formally for investors. And so that was the birth of expectations investing. Now, I'll say the timing of that book could not have been uh, I don't know if it could have been worse. It actually came out September 10th, 2001, so a day before a national tragedy, in the middle of a three-year bear market. Right when we, when we signed the book contract, it was a roaring bull market, and then in the middle of a bear market. But I think that those principles have really stood the test of time. I think this idea that, as you said, I mean, you go reverse engineer expectations, it, it takes a lot of the onus off of you making all these pinpoint precision forecast and just allows you to understand basically the over under. And that's a lot more tractable problem for most people to try to think about. And, you know, you incorporate that with some other ideas like base rates and so forth. And you have a really robust way of thinking about probabilistically whether, you know, whether particular investments are likely to, uh, to, to pay off. I'm glad you mentioned base rates. I, I feel like that's one of the most important things. Well, I keep saying this. I feel like I'm talking to Howard Marks. You know, he wrote this book, The Most Important Thing. It's got 18 most important things. And Michael Mobison is the guy with like 100 most important things. But but base rates is definitely one of your most important concepts. Do you agree with that? I mean, that's really one of your big ones. I do. Um, and by the way, you know, these are, this is, you know, I, I wish I could take claim to any of these ideas. None of them are mine. But, you know, base rates was an idea that I learned about primarily through Danny Kahneman. And, um, you know, it's this idea that when we solve problems, we usually use what he calls the inside view, which is, you know, we gather information, we combine it with our own experience, we combine it with our 
own uh, views of the world, and then we forecast. And, 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 and in finance, that's the common way to do things. If I said to you, you know, Dan, what do you think? You know, go analyze IBM or something. You know, you do what most people do. You read a bunch of stuff about it. You build a model on it and so forth. The outside view or this application of base rates basically says, let me think about this problem of an instance of a larger reference class. Which, you know, let, let, me, let me ask what other people, what happened to other people when they're in this situation before. And it's a, it's a very, very unnatural way to think about the world for a couple of reasons. First is you have to leave aside you know, your own views of things and leave aside your own experience. And we tend to place a lot of weight on our own subjective views of the world. And second is you have to find and appeal to the base rate. And, and usually base rates are not at your fingertips. They, they, it's unlikely. In the world of finance, we have a lot of information about corporate performance, but rarely, if I said to you, you know, what is the distribution of growth rates of revenues for $5 billion companies, you know, you, you're not going to have that number at your fingertips or that range at your fingertips. So I think the, what, you know, the argument that Kahneman made and Kahneman Traversky even back in the 1970s was, the thoughtful integration of the inside and the outside view, so your own views along with base rates, is a very, very powerful way to think about many things in life. And uh, by the way, the first time I met Danny Kahneman, which is a real thrill for me, and that was 2005, and I, uh, he gave a little presentation, and, and the term that he used was this concept called discipline intuition. And the argument was that you should always start with the base rates and then introduce your own views of things. And uh, the, but, you know, not the other way around. It shouldn't be your own intuition and then introduce the base rates um, because then you'll be more biased. And I've always found, found that to be very, very powerful. So I think that the idea, idea of base rates and by the way, the application to finance is extraordinary, not just in thinking about the, the likelihood of corporate performance. But there's actually another whole set of keys here that are really fascinating, which is understanding base rates really gives you extraordinary insight into regression toward the mean. And, and, and if you talk to any investor, or certainly any value investor, they'll... Michael, Michael. I'm going to interrupt you because I'm, I've, I've been a bad host. Let's tell our listener what base rates are and then talk about mean reversion. Oh, yeah. So ba that's my, that was my fault. Yeah. So base rate will basically say, you're going to look at uh, the performance that's happened in the past for a particular thing. So as I said, like, you know, ask what happened when other people were in the situation before. Let's, let's give a concrete example. <clears throat> so you, let's say you're looking at a company with, I'll make this up, with $10 billion of revenues, and, and you want to know what is the likely growth rate of this company going forward, right? So, that, so and let's say we'll say five-year growth rate. So the base rate would say, let's look at every company that was started that started with $10 billion of revenues, and let's look at the distribution of those growth rates. You know, how, uh, you know, what percent grew at 25%, what percent grew at 20%, 15%, and what percent shrunk, and so forth. So you have, you can imagine almost like a bell-shaped distribution of, distri uh, of growth rates for those companies. So a base rate is essentially a record of what's happened in the past. You know, another example would be mergers and acquisitions. Company A buys company B, you know, in, in those kinds of deals, what percent of the time does companies A stock go up? What percent of the time does it go down? By how much and so forth, right? So it's basically looking at, the, at looking at history to understand or get a sense of what might happen in the future. Okay, great. And then you were about to talk about uh, regression to the mean as being... Right. So this is a, it's a really powerful way to understand regression to the mean because it, it, you know, when, when you go into the math of all these things, you start to understand that some, when there's a lot of skill in the system... There's a lot of so-called persistence. What happened before is likely to happen again. You know, you and I run a sprint against Usain Bolt. It doesn't matter what your former <laughs> track record is. Um, he's going to win those races every single time. And there's no regression. There's no, there's no change. By contrast, if it's an all-luck activity, there's a ton of regression toward the mean. Um, in fact, if you win the lottery last yesterday, there's no reason to believe you'll win tomorrow. And so as a consequence, understanding where things fall in the luck skill continuum um, and, and base rates help us understand those things, allow us to understand the rate of regression toward the mean. Not just that it happens, which it does, but the rate at which it's going to happen. So it's a very, it's a, it's a very, very powerful mental model. Um, and like you said, like the most important thing. If you'd ask me if I could teleport myself back to my, my younger uh, analyst self um, and I could give one mental model, uh, it would be the base rate idea. I think it's the most powerful idea that uh, is underutilized in the financial community. Yeah, so talking about uh, regression to the mean, like we could think about, um, you know, the market return as being the mean. And if we do think about that, 
like we know that most funds, you know, don't perform as well as the market and probably most individual investors, if we look at the Dalbar study. Um, so we're, we're mostly, most people are doing worse than mere luck, right? In the stock market. And, and it seems like most people have no business being in the stock market because they, they can't even seem to, to revert to that basic mean of the, the market return. Right. Well, I say, so first of all, I would just say, first of all, that, that, that for most investors who, you know, are certainly not inclined or don't have the time or, you know, energy to try to either analyze companies and buy stocks themselves or identify managers who they think can do it effectively, those people should, so should index, right? And I think that that's obviously that message is out. Um, huge amounts of flows have gone into index funds and ETFs. And for the most part, that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, just to take a pause for a moment, just to state the obvious, um, that can't go on forever, right? So active managers do two really important things for the world. First is they promote price discovery, which is a fancy way of saying they gather the information that's relevant and they make it reflected in prices, right? And that's, so essentially they make prices efficient. And that's a really important activity that's societally very valuable. Okay, so that's a big deal. And the debate we have to have is what percent of all money run has to be active for that function to be provided. And that's a, you, know, you can talk about that a bunch of different ways, but that the, the active management's not going away. And then the second thing is that uh, active managers provide liquidity. And liquidity is a very, you know, this idea of liquidity just means you can translate it, uh, for example, a stock into cash or cash into a stock with very little cost or a little friction. And liquidity is important, especially at certain, at certain points in the cycle. So, so active managers do provide vital roles. I do think that if you look at active managers in general, they, they tend to do a little bit better than the stock market overall, but that is um, offset by the fees that they charge, right? So they, they come out probably pre-fee a little bit better and then post-fee a little bit worse. So um, yeah, most, most individuals probably should be, um, should be indexing. Now, the interesting question I think we're facing now in markets are these open questions, and I'm not sure I know the answers personally, but the fact that people are moving so much money into index funds and ETFs, does that create distortions? And the distortions that would probably come to your mind are one would be valuation distortions, right? Because every, you're just buying a basket of securities, you're paying no attention to the fundamentals. And, you know, there was early evidence, for instance, that uh, one of the ways we could try to isolate that effect is stocks that would go in and out of indices, right? So uh, S&P 500 adds a certain number of companies and, and takes a certain number of companies out. Does that affect the valuation of those businesses? I think the early evidence was that that did affect them. Um, I think there's less less of that now, but but that's an interesting one. The second is, are there are there greater correlations, right? Because one of the benefits of diversification is you buy companies of different different exposures, and uh, if they're not correlated with one another, you get the benefits of diversification. But if you're uh, we're dealing with baskets or indexes, uh, the question is: Is correlation do correlations rise? In which case, the benefits of diversification become less pronounced. And um, the third one is again goes back to the same thing: it's this idea of liquidity, right? Does it affect liquidity? The fact that most people have this money locked up in these things, and and there's less less to trade out there. Um, by the way, all these things I think are, are people have talked a lot about them. I think that they, they're, they're even more pronounced in the bond market than they are in the stock market. But I think there's a very uh, uh, active ongoing research uh, on all these topics. And I think that I don't, I don't know all the, the full answers on those things. So yeah, my advice to people would be um, that they should probably, they probably should index if they're not interested. But the fact is that there are still opportunities for people, um, for active managers by definition. And uh, I'll, I'll just do one slightly academic thing. There's a really you know, famous paper written in 1980 called On the Impossibility of Informationally Efficient Markets. It's Sandy Grossman and Joe Stiglitz. And, and the argument is pretty straightforward. They say markets can't be perfectly efficient. And the reason is that there's a cost to gathering information and reflecting it in prices. And so long as there's a cost to doing that, there should be a benefit in the form of excess returns. So um, Lasse Pedersen, another finance professor, has got this clever term. He says markets are efficiently inefficient, right? There has to be enough inefficiency 
to encourage active managers to go out and try to find those inefficiencies and take advantage of them. But uh, they can't be, there can't be a lot of $20 bills or $100 bills lying on the sidewalk. So it's a really interesting set of questions. So the punchline is, though, we're in the active management world is not going to go away. But for most people, um, and by the way, the other things, indexers are free riders, right? They are free riding off the active managers in terms of price discovery. And I have no, you know, I have no problem with free riding, um, but I, just, I think we should be clear about what it is and call it out for what it is. So let's come at this another way with another study that you discuss. And I, I'm sorry, I can't even remember which book. I have like all your books and I, I get them confused sometimes. But it's the one with the brain damage subjects and the normal subjects. Tell us about that. And I have a very specific question about that. But tell us about that. Yeah, and I think that, that study mostly related to, to loss aversion. So the setup is... Um, you take a group of people who are who have brain damage, and and the key is that they have a very specific type of brain damage. So um, they're also often stroke victims. So they can do mathematical calculations very well. They have normal IQs and so forth. But the part of their brain that's damaged is that that relates to emotion. So they're they're emotionally sort of flatlined. They don't really feel fear or or greed or anger. They they just don't have a lot of emotional um, pulse. And then you compare them to people who are normal, um, so people off the street. And the way this um, experiment was set up is you were endowed with $20, so everybody's got $20 up front, and then you played uh, a game where the researcher would flip a coin, and if you called it right or came up tails or whatever it is, you would get $2.50, and if you called it wrong, you would lose your – okay, so you hand your dollar over to the researcher, and then they flip the coin. Two fifty if you got it right, and you lose your dollar if you get it wrong. Now, each round of the game, you could do one of two things. You could either hand your dollar over and then have the coin flip, or you could just keep it and just go to the next round, right? So there you, you were guaranteed to keep your dollar, right? So that's the setup. And, you know, you don't have to do a lot of math to understand that you should, you should hand your money over to the research, right? Because it's a, it's a $1.25 expected value, right? 50% times the two fifty versus losing your dollar, right? So you should hand your money over to the researcher. And the goal of the ex experiment is to have the most money at the end, right? So it turns out they do this experiment and the brain damaged people end up with 13% more money than the normal people, which by the way, in 20 rounds of a game is actually a, a pretty big margin of difference. And uh, the key when they sort of unpacked it was that the um, brain damaged people played many more rounds than the normal people did. And in particular, they played twice as many rounds after having lost. So I think the psychology of what's going on here is that you're, you're a normal person. And by the way, the first few rounds of the game, everyone got that they should hand their money over, so they all do this. But you're a normal person, and you, and you lose two or three times in a row. And you start to say, you know what? My, I'm seeing my bankroll go down. This doesn't feel good. Right? You say, maybe I'll just sit out a couple rounds. I'll keep those dollars. I'll, I'll put them back in, and then I'll play when I feel better. Right? And so you think about the stock market environment that when people suffer losses, they will willingly turn down obviously net present value positive investments. That's the basic moral of the story. So you think about the first quarter of 2009, right? We'd been through a horrible fall of 2008. Markets are down sharply. Most everybody who's involved has lost money. We don't really know where the bottom's gonna be on all this stuff. Mathematically, you'd say, Hmm, S and P is at six seventy. Earnings power is probably you know seventy or eighty bucks. You know the math of whether the and the risk premium were through the roof. The math of whether the market was compelling was pretty straightforward. Although you just suffered through a horrible period, and most people felt that they should not get involved with the market, right, or, or even pull their money out of the stock market, right. So the brain damaged people not suffering from that same set of inhibitions basically says, uh, I just get that it's good. NPV, so I'm going to net present value, so I'm just going to basically go go for it. So that's that study, and, and the moral of the story is not to say that you should be emotionally flatlined throughout your life, but to say more that um, understand that your emotional state will affect your assessment of an investment opportunity. And in this case, we had one that was overtly, mathematically, straightforwardly positive, and people still chose not to play because they were they were stung by recent losses. So what was the question you were going to ask, Dan? You got something specific on that? Well, actually, maybe it's not a question. I just, it, it struck <laughs> me. Comment, it yeah. struck me. Yeah, comment. Sorry. It, so it just struck me 
as really, really the the salient feature of that whole story is people with you know brain damage, people with without the emotional engagement of so called normal people, bet twice as often after a loss, and that that really it, it's one of the things that tells me like okay, you say most people should index, and I I. When I said most people shouldn't be in the stock market, I think I'm effectively saying that. I'm saying they, they shouldn't be actively managing their own account, buying and selling individual securities for that reason. Because if you're normal, if you're just a regular normal human being, like being a normal human being kind of sets you up for failure, it seems like, in the stock market, which is a little crazy because everybody's in it. <laughs> Right. And you mentioned before briefly this Dalbar study, and I'm not sure Dalbar is the best of this, but, you know, <clears throat> there does appear to be, you know, a gap in, in returns. And just to take one little step back, you know, it's an interesting and, and, you know, I think Jack Bogle, the great Jack Bogle talked to for a bit about this. So it turns out that if you look at the average, you know, you look at the stock market does some rate of return over time. You look at the average active mutual fund <clears throat> does a shade below that, mostly because of fees. But if you look at the average individual investor, they do substantially worse. They do something like 60% of the market's returns. Um, and this is, that's, people call it the investor gap, right? Which is, the reason is they tend to buy high and sell low. They do the opposite of what they're supposed to, to do. And one of the points I always like to make is that, you know, the, the, these numbers vacillate over time. And I think actually they've improved over time. But you know, historically, folks like Jack Bogle have suggested that number could be as high as 100, and Delbar numbers are higher, but I, I think with a good methodology, something like 120 basis points per year. Now, in, in a world where, you know, a reasonable nominal return for the stock market is probably, I don't know, 7 8%, whatever the number would be, <clears throat> 120 basis points, uh, 1.2 percentage points is a lot, right? And so, this is not this is not a sort of an you know, we, we obviously gave it through the lens of an experiment, but this is not this is real life because when you lose 120 basis points per year, compound that over 10, 20, 30 years, that's a substantial differential in terminal wealth as a consequence of that. So, you know, avoiding some of these mistakes um, can be, especially when you consider the role of compounding, it can make a huge difference in, in a huge difference in people's outcomes and, and their lives. Yeah, so you have a really good technique for helping people kind of get over some of this called a decision journal. What is that? So I mentioned when I um, talked to Kahneman the first time, you know, he mentioned this discipline intuition. I also that day asked him for the one bit of advice he would give to a manager, an investor. And he said, you know, without like hesitating, he said, you should have a, just a journal of your decisions. And so the argument is that when you make a consequential decision, um, you should write down what you expect to happen, why you expect to happen. You should also note how you feel physically and emotionally about the decision. And then um, if possible, you should, when you talk about your expectations, you should express those things in probabilities, not words like, I think there's a good chance that X, Y, Z will do that, but rather in probabilities, actual numbers. And the argument is that this allows you to um, cr uh, give yourself <clears throat> honest and accurate feedback on your decisions, right? So what happens is you make a decision and whether it turns out well or turns out poorly and whether it's well for the good for the right reasons or good for the wrong reasons or bad for the right reasons or bad for the wrong reasons, you tend to make up a story that puts yourself in a good light, right? You tend to, you, you, you justify things that turned out badly or whatever it is. And so when you've written it down, and, uh, and, by, and by the way, typically there, there are two things that come into play. One's called hindsight bias. Is you, you, you think you knew it was going to happen with a greater probability than you actually did, and you haven't written it down, so you can't prove that one way or another. And the other is this concept called creeping determinism, which is you start to think you knew it was going to happen with a, um, you know, um, I mean, you, you thought that what was going to happen was inevitable in some way. So the journal allows you to keep track of your forecasts, keep track of your thoughts, and to give yourself honest feedback. And, the, and the, I think one thing that's been demonstrated in psychology and a lot of other fields is that timely and accurate feedback is what allows you to get better at what you're doing. So timely and accurate feedback for forecasting allows you to become a better forecaster. And there's a lot of good evidence to support that. So I think the journal is, is, is that, is, is a way of being 
it's it's not overly it's not expensive it's not time consuming but you need discipline right to just make sure you're jotting down what you think is going to happen why how you feel and what the probabilities are so that you can keep track and have a, a means to give yourself accurate timely feedback that is that is such a great suggestion it's a, such a simple thing that i'm i'm betting most people within the sound of our voices won't do it but it's one of those things that um it's so powerful and so simple that people hear you say, yeah, just keep a decision journal and, and it'll have this great effect on your decision making. And they say, really? That, you know, people want something sexier, but uh, in this case, that's it. All you have to do is keep that journal and you'll see your thinking slapping you in the face. Yeah, a lot of the stuff for decision making to improve decision making, like you said, is actually pretty, pretty straightforward, maybe even slightly boring stuff. And I'll, I'll also say that um, I, just to be more more concrete about this is that you know a lot of the a lot of these, some of these techniques were developed, for example, in scoring systems for probabilistic estimates and so forth. They were developed for for example for meteorologists, right? So people forecasting the weather. And the one thing we and, and this has also happened in medicine and so forth. And what we've seen consistently is when people get that feedback, they get better. And, and this is something we can quantify. They get better at it. So if you say I want to get better at what I'm doing in probabilistic forecasting, this is just it's just a, a very straightforward technique, but it's, it's been it's got it's tried and true in terms of uh, performance enhancement. Yeah. So speaking of medicine, how do you feel about checklists? Huge fan of checklists, by the way. And, and you know, Atul Gawande wrote the Checklist Manifesto. I know you're based in Baltimore. A lot of this was, was based on work that came out of Johns Hopkins. Um, so uh, now I will just say my practical experience with checklists and investment organizations is that they're not always super easy to implement. And I think part of the reason is that investment professionals often feel as much as anything is that they're artisans, right? They're, they're sort of, um, there's a, there's a bit of judgment, a lot of judgment that goes into to what they do. So I have found that uh, where checklists tend to be most effective is on almost the technical aspects of how you do analysis. So, so let me be a little bit more concrete. You know, I think if you develop a checklist for how to estimate the cost of capital, a checklist for how to calculate return on invested capital, a checklist for how to think about a company's uh, potential sustainable competitive advantage. Those are areas that they're almost subcomponents to a broader um, uh, investment thesis where you want to make sure that in an organization you have consistency, you have rigor, it's being done properly. And so that when two analysts are talking about a company whose return on capital being 15%, they mean precisely the same thing. So I think checklists are incredibly powerful. Now, look, in other domains, you know, aviation, medicine, um, incredible uh, value in checklists. And once again, probably not notwithstanding their their evident power still probably underutilized and still still we get more upside from these things but um yeah so i'm a big i'm a big checklist checklist fan by the way atul gawande essentially everything that guy's done the guy's just terrific I, I i find his all his work really really fascinating um by the way i listened to a podcast with him a while back and he mentioned something that i actually went and tracked it down it was, it was a paper that influenced him that was written in the 1970s about medical mistakes, basically. And they said they basically said that there are two basically reasons there are mistakes, right? One is just ignorance. We don't know how to do a certain surgery, or we don't know how this, you know, how to treat this particular disease. And obviously, there's a lot of R and D and all that trying to reduce that ignorance gap. And I think there's some of that stuff we can talk about in the world of finance as well. But the second was, and probably more significant, was people just don't do what they know they're supposed to do. Right. So it's, it's not it's not that they're ignorant of it, uh, like the checklist for the doctors. Right. They know that they're supposed to do these things. It's just they don't always do them uh, as faithfully and as accurately and as timely as they should. So so that's where uh, there's a lot of upside in performance, uh, whether it's medicine or investing or other fields, just by doing what we know you're supposed to do more effectively. So I think checklists are incredibly powerful. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that study because I was going to bring it up because we were talking about how boring and straightforward some of these things are. And the things, you know, that second thing where you don't do what you're supposed to do in medicine, you know, it's just like all the basic little things that you do in preparation for surgery, for example, you know, wash your hands a certain number of times with a, a certain way. 
It's all boring and simple, but it's extraordinarily powerful. And I have to tell you, this has been a challenge for me in my life. You know, I there are things I know that are good for me, but I think, uh, you know, is it that big of a deal? It doesn't seem like it. It's not, you know, it's, and it's just not sexy enough. We need to figure out how to make this stuff sexy, man. Yeah, so I don't know if I don't, you know, I don't know if it'll ever become sexy, but I do think that there's a lot of interesting work on um, and I think the medicine folks, the, the doctors are doing some of this, which is, and it's an interesting thing, even Dan, just in your sort of personal observation, which is, can you reshape or, uh, or change your environment to some degree that allows you to reduce the cost of doing the things you're supposed to do, right? So even in, it's a great example with, um, you know, with the doctors and, you know, inter, putting in inter, intravenous tubes, which is a lot of where this work came from. You know, they found that the doctors knew exactly what they were supposed to do, as you said, you know, the protocols for washing your hands and cleaning the area and, and on the patient and so on and so forth. What they, what they also found, though, is that a lot of the materials they needed or where they had to walk were all over the place. And so they said, you know, when we put all the essential things we need on a particular cart that allows the physician to do these things, so they create an environment where these things are right at the fingertips of the physician, and he or she can do these things like very, you know, sort of in a very structured and ordered way, that helps a lot. So that's what I would always say is, are there, th just thinking about ways to um, shift or manipulate your environment in such a way that allows you to, uh, reduces your cost to implement these kinds of things. And I think that's a lot, I mean, there's a lot to be done with that kind of stuff. And it's, that's also very simple, not very sexy, but very effective. Right, it reminds me of this, the study you talked about in your book, Think Twice, with people buying wine, the situational awareness of, you know, when the French music was playing in the grocery store, they bought more French wine. When the German music was playing in the same grocery store, they bought more German wine and less French wine. And it's almost like we, we have to learn how to manipulate our own environment. We're kind of, it, it's a, this sort of recursive thing. We're looking back on ourselves and looking at our environment and saying, how can I shape this thing around me to, to influence me back, you know, on me? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's and that's the thing. So, you, yeah, you just want to set yourself up. I mean, there are lots of little examples, but you want to set yourself up. And there, there, there are there are trivial things. You know, if you if you want to follow a particular type of diet that prevents you from eating carbs or whatever it is, you just get rid of the carbs. You just make them so they're not available anywhere in your environment, and that helps, right? Because um, it's not at your fingertips. So there there are little techniques like that that anybody can employ that I think can be very well, very helpful. All right. Well, Michael, we're actually at the end of our time. We've actually gone a little over, but you're Michael Mobison, so I reserve the right to go over time with you. Um, I wonder if I could ask you uh, if there was one thing that you could just leave our listeners with, what might that be? Well, I think that um, when I when I think about investing, well, really anything in life, but I think about investing and I think about the quality of the investors who I admire the most it almost always comes back to curiosity. And I think, Dan, you, you exhibit a lot of this as well, right? Which is just trying to understand how things work, um, understand different points of view, understand what people in different fields do and how they're effective or not effective. And I think it's just this idea of curiosity. And, and if you're curious about things, what that often leads you to do is, is to read, um, and again, reading outside of your field, and try to understand um, whether there are lessons from other disciplines, mental models from other disciplines that may make you more effective at what you do. Now, I think there's a downside to some of this curiosity, which is you may, you know, you may read an article or a book or something that may not have any relevance to your day job now. Um, so there may be some intellectual cul-de-sacs, but eventually I just think that this accumulation of, of sort of mental models can be incredibly powerful. So to me, the, the one thing I would leave with people is, is, is if, if you have a spark of curiosity, feed that as much as you can and uh, build on it. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have to tell you, Michael, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you. I've wanted to talk with you for some time, and I hope that you'll come back and talk with us sometime again. Would love to. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure's been mine. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, it's time for the mailbag, folks. This is a fun time for me because this is where you and I get to interact. So whatever's on your mind, I want to hear from you. This is a really important part of the show for me. I read every single email. Concerns, questions, comments, politely worded criticisms, send it all 
to feedback at investorhour.com. And I guarantee you, I promise you, I will read it. I mean, I even read the Russian spam emails, okay? And the gratuitous, you know, request for, uh, I, I, get a, I get all these emails that I did not solicit from people who want to be on the show and sell their products. So I read all of them, even the garbage. So I will definitely be interested in reading your good stuff. Let's get on with it. I've got three of them today. The first one is from Peter G., a long time, very thoughtful, intelligent correspondent. Peter G. says, hi, Dan. I've been reading your digest essays for the past week, and I have just one question. What about Steve's melt-up thesis? What you say, and I'm not saying you're incorrect, directly contradicts Steve's thesis with regard to a buying frenzy before the fall, before the fall of the market, not the fall of the year. <laughs> or maybe he does mean the fall of the year. I haven't, I haven't been following exactly what Steve's saying up to the minute. But in other words, Steve has this melt-up thesis. He says the stock market's going to melt up before it falls. And I've been, uh, in my digest essays in the past week or so here, I've been kind of bearish, real bearish. I've been telling people to be worried about debt markets and overpriced equities and stuff. So he says, I directly contradict Steve. Actually, what I've said, and I said this in public a couple of times in a couple different places, what I've said is that a melt-up would not surprise me at all. And Steve, we're doing something a little bit different. Steve has a melt-up script. He says, you know, there's a script. And in a script, by its nature, it tells you what happens next. You know, exactly what happens next. And Steve says, well, you know, next comes the melt-up. And for me, when I see a melt-up, that's going to confirm to me that we're in, you know, crazyville and that the crash, the 50 to 60% crash in the S&P 500 that I expect in the next few years uh, is coming. But you'll notice I've said in the next few years. I don't know if it's 2019, 2020, or 2024. I really don't know. I just know that when things have gotten like this in the past, they've been followed by really terrible returns from that moment for the next several years. Like when you buy, which is another way of saying if you buy at the peak, when valuations are really stretched, you're not going to make any money for a long time on that investment. And I think that's where we are now. And the market tends to correct those things by punishing the valuations the other direction, making them way too cheap. In other words, making stock prices fall and bond prices too. Some of this junky debt that I've been referring to in these digest essays that Peter G is talking about. Uh, so that's my comment. I don't think I directly contradict. I'm just talking more about the end of the cycle, this looking like the end of the cycle. And at some point, it's really going to fall apart. Steve says, yes, at some point it will fall apart. But before that happens, we usually get this huge melt up. And he doesn't think we've seen that yet. So that's it. That's the difference. I think it's substantial enough that I'm not maybe directly contradicting, but I can definitely see how you interpret it that way. And, you know, Steve can be wrong. I can be wrong. Steve's got a good track record with this stuff. I have a decent track record with saying, holy hell, this is, there's a lot of risk out there right now. Um, one time in my entire career, I said, it's a good idea to buy put options October 1st, 2018, before the market lost 19% in, in three months. Uh, and you know, I got crazy concerned April, 2008 and said the crisis was going to get really bad. Banks were going to fail dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. And it happened. Okay. Next on the mailbag, number two, this is from Eric J. Eric J says, Dear Dan, thanks for having Annie Duke on the Investor Hour. She was fantastic in all caps. Her interview and the one previous interview on Second Level Thinking has influenced me to think differently. I really find this educational and enlightening. I would love to hear Annie again in the future. I'm not sure which interview he's talking about on Second Level Thinking. I think we might have talked about that with Tim Price. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear Annie again in the future. I just want to remind everybody she's got a book coming out in April that you can pre-order on Amazon if you want. I will, when the book comes out, I will buy it. I will read it. And Annie seemed to be implying that she would come back and talk to us about it. So I, I don't, you know, I can't issue a guarantee, but I think you're going to see her on here again. 
Thank you, Eric J. And one more from Gary D. Gary D. hits me up on Twitter and, and writes us a lot of good emails. He's got a long one here, but it's not too terribly long, so I'll read the whole thing. Hello, Dan. Like many of your listeners and Extreme Value readers, right about now we are all thanking our lucky stars or just good decisions. Ha ha, he says. He doesn't know if it's luck or good decisions. For moving a solid concentration of our assets into gold and gold-like investments, I currently have positions in, and then he gives me the ticker symbols for Barrick, Franco, Nevada, Sprott Gold and Silver Trust, Osisco Gold Royalties, Wheat and Precious Metal, Altius Minerals, and Royal Gold. All of these investments have performed very well for us over the last few months. Thanks for all your recommendations regarding these. However, in turning my thinking towards gold and gold-like investments, I keep thinking about the history of gold and our fiat currency. Stansbury, along with others, tell us frequently that the U.S. was pulled off the gold standard by then-President Nixon in 1971 or so, but honestly, I was just a sophomore in high school then and thinking much more about chasing skirts than global monetary policy. Would you care to devote a rant or two about the history of the American relationship to gold and currency? What has it been? What did it do for us? Why did he do it? Can we go back? Would What would be the impact of, of going back? Yada, yada, yada. That He said yada, yada, yada in his email. That wasn't me. He continues, Rickards has been clamoring, Jim Rickards, uh, has been clamoring over the last several years about the U.S. returning to a gold standard with gold valued at $10,000 an ounce. How likely is that? He thinks Trump is warm to the idea, but what would that do? Does it truly limit future growth? Lots of interesting arguments for and against. And, and as always, I would love to hear your thoughts. Great guests, as always. I love the podcast. Please keep up the good work. The poker player was fascinating. I really appreciated a tangential look at investing mindset through the eyes of a decision maker. Thanks, your friend Gary D. Great email, Gary. Lots to unpack there on gold. You know, how likely is it? What would happen? What's the history? There's a lot there. I don't think it's going to happen during my lifetime. Certainly the government won't do this. You know, the Federal Reserve is the Amazon.com of currency. Uh, they're not going to give up without a fight. They like their power. And all those 600 economists working for them like their jobs. So, and they like, they just like having control of the currency. You know, people don't give that up. The, and every banker, are you kidding? Every banker in the world will fight tooth and nail to keep central banks in control of currencies and in control of banking. You know, the Federal Reserve is, is kind of the banking regulator. And, the, you know, banks, are, there's so many people on the side, so many people in power close to decision makers that what would have to happen is that the currency would have to fail in some major way. To get, back, to get back on a real gold standard. And it would never be an official U.S. gold standard, in my opinion, in my opinion. It would be a de facto gold standard where people would be less inclined to take your U.S. dollars and more inclined to take your, uh, you know, whatever you got, your gold-backed something or other, uh, or, you know, actual gold. But that just seems so far-fetched. I, I don't want to say it can't happen, I think it can, but I, you know, I, I can't say that I think it's likely at all. And he, Rickards, James Rickards thinks that Donald Trump is warm to the idea, you say. You know, I'm sure he's warm to a lot of ideas that are never going to happen. I, I just, you know, I don't think he has enough. I don't think Donald Trump ha is the, is a capable of exercising the amount of influence necessary or even marshalling the troops of influence. It's just an enormous, enormous thing. It, it's an enormous endeavor. It cannot happen without, in my opinion, without a lot of other dominoes falling. And right now, those dominoes, if you just look at the market prices of things and the state of things with the U.S. dollar and, and the nature of, you know, what what people get put in their hands when they sell things all over the world it's mostly us dollars and there's a natural you know it has a natural moat because people use it and 
because people use it, they'll keep using it. It's a, it's a, it's a thorny thing to try to figure out how we would actually get to a gold standard. And would it be good? You know, I've heard all kinds of different arguments one way or the other. I feel like it would exercise discipline on governments that like to print money and issue lots of debt and get us in all kinds of trouble. Um, but who knows? Maybe it would, maybe there's a, a, a knock on effect that I'm not considering of going back to a gold standard after you've been off of one since 1971. And really, even 1971, um, we weren't on a gold standard. You know, you countries, you know, foreign countries could could redeem in gold. But you and I couldn't. You and I haven't been able to do that for a long, long time, during our lifetimes. I mean, it just, that has, I guess, during my father's lifetime, but he's like 93. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see it happening, but great topic. Maybe we will do a little bit on the history of gold and currency. Thank you, Gary D. That's the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Listen, check out our website, www.investorhour.com. It's got everything. It's got every episode we ever did, transcripts for every episode we ever did. You know, the most recent episode always takes a couple of days for the transcript to get there, but we do transcripts for every episode you can get all the latest updates if you put your email in there. Just you can sign up, put your email in, and we'll we'll email you and let you know when episodes are ready and all kinds of other good stuff. So that's at www.investorhour.com. That's it for this week. It's my privilege to come to you. Thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you next week. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansbury Investor Hour is produced by Stansbury Research and is copyrighted by the Stansbury Radio Network.